you have any prayer requests, please let us know, or you can join us every Friday. We love to pray for you. And we do have the Bible verse in the book of Psalms, chapter 13, verse 17 to 18. Let me read it for you, my brother and sister. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to those who have broken heart and saved such as have a contrite spirit. Amen. 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 I invite everyone to stand up as we start our Sunday service. Amen. Hallelujah. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for the privilege of life that you've given us, Lord Jesus. We thank you for the whole year that you are being our God, our Savior. You gave us the never-ending love, the unconditional love in Jesus' name. Father God, I acknowledge your presence as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We invite you, Holy Spirit, to lead us in our service today, Father God, as we celebrate the new year that coming, Lord, with prayer and worship and service only to you, Father Jesus. Hallelujah. Father God, I lift up to you the Sunday service today, Holy Spirit. I ask you in the name of Jesus to work in us, Lord Jesus, to anoint the service, hallelujah, to anoint everyone, Lord, through our pastor that delivered us your word, Father God, in the name of Jesus. The same thing, Lord, to our worship leader that will anoint all the songs that give us the joy, Amen. the peace, hallelujah, and the love that come only to you that filled us from the top of our head to the soles of our feet. Father God, whatever you've seen in our heart, Lord, that trouble us, Lord, that hindering us, Lord, to worship in a service like this, Lord Jesus, we ask forgiveness. And we ask you to break the chain of the devil that gave us the hard time, Lord Jesus, for giving us the doubt. I break it in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. And I declare victory in the name of Jesus. I declare your presence in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Father God. I lift up to you everything, Lord Jesus, as we declare in the name of Jesus that 2024 will be more than, more than a blessing to our life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We thank you in Jesus' name. All the saints, all the people says, Amen. amen. Yes. 
is running after, is running after me. Your goodness, your goodness is running after, is running after me. When my life lay down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, is running. It's running after, it's running after me, your goodness, your goodness is running There's power in your voice. There's power in singing. When you sing out your thankfulness, the goodness of God, man, he comes through every single time. Amen. Maybe you, some of you guys have things that have been unfulfilled, prayers that have been unanswered. You were expecting them in 2023.
believe the Lord's saying today, today, God will fulfill it, amen? It's never too late for the Lord. Let it be right now, Lord. having been with a family, that even after we've done all this excess of eating and of gifts, the reflection might be, which I heard actually out of their mouth, you know, oh, we ate too much, and oh, the kids are too spoiled, and, and yet, without the Spirit of God, they're going to get up and do it again next year. And that, to me, is sad, because uh, I'm not going to keep doing the same dead things again and again. And so I say, God, um, having the picture of what, could, what I can put into before you in prayer and in purity of what I have to share, what you've given me to share, God. I want it to count for the most because it is for your pleasure, it is for your glory, and it is for eternity. Thank you, Lord. Good. Praise God. Hallelujah. <laughs> it's a new day. <laughs> it's not a new year. It's just a new day. So tomorrow is a new year. <laughs> Amen. Well, I, I, just, I just thank God for all the things, you know, that is given me all, all throughout the years. And, of course, I know every one of you have something in your mind. What will be your next? Or what would it be like on the 2024? Well, <clears throat> to sum up what we have talked about, the meaning of Christmas or the advent of Christ, the coming of Jesus Christ in the world. Uh, and today, we're just going to sum that up. And we thought we, 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 uh, we have that a little bit, a small series for five Sundays. We have that hope that we, we saw, Emmanuel, that God is with us. They have that influence that we have, uh, that we heard yesterday. And of course, the six gifts that Mickey shared uh, last Sunday, the six gifts that God gave to us, right? And there are all come into, fall into this one part of what we're going to talk about today, which is the, the finale of the advent of the Christ, you know, that small series that we have. So to start with, uh, <clears throat> I'm just going to, uh, what mm. I'm saying is just like, our response for this advent of Christmas, okay? So what we're going to do now, let me point out these things. Uh, look at that. This right here had an arrow towards the cross. So that's where I, what we wanted to respond today. <laughs> from that manger, oh, okay, from that manger to the cross, Okay, <laughs> I point at that arrow but, uh, to emphasize that word. Okay, mm -hmm. to begin with, let's review something uh, about what we just heard. So we've been talking about Isaiah 9, chapter 6. And again, I'm going to talk about that a little bit. Uh, For unto us a child is born. Unto us is a son is a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulder and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Thank you, Lord, for this wonderful promise that you have given us towards men that can, through this, Lord, we will be able to set us free from this world, just knowing the fact that this world is full of darkness, and here we are. Lord, you gave us this sun to shine, O oh Lord God. And in our lives, O oh Lord Jesus, that we embrace that Jesus Christ is Lord of our lives and we also shine. And Lord, today we will give it all to you, all the things that we are about to, to lay down to you, Lord. We, 
we, we just be ready on what you're gonna go to do today, starting today and till the end. I pray, Lord, that may your spirit be with us all throughout. Speak to us clearly, and we want to hear your voice, empty our hearts, empty our minds, but fill us up with your spirit in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. So, again, this is our hope, and the people who walk in the darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. You know, that is the promise that that, that child was born for all of us. As I said, we, we always think about Jesus is the reason for this season. That is true. Everyone should know that. But to tell you the truth, you are the reason for this season. Because Jesus came down for, for you. Amen? Yeah. And, and it happened on perfect evening, which is the hope that we have. It happened on perfect evening. A child born unto us a perfect night, holy and peaceful, brightly filled with joy and glory. I like that every day of my life. A, whole, a holy night, a holy day, a peaceful day, a brightly day, no darkness in my life, something like that, and, and filled with joy and the glory of God. Don't, don't you like that on 2024 in your life? I like that in my life, you know. And, and, and that is the perfect. So if you have that, you have perfect day, perfect night. And it happened on perfect evening when Jesus Christ was born. No, a child, the word of God is the promise, and this is the ultimate source of hope. Jesus Christ is the word, is the promise, and is our hope. That's what you know, that in the beginning, in the beginning uh, was the word, and the word was with God, and the word is God, and the word became flesh and lived among us. And I am convinced that Jesus is the promise of hope. When there is promise, there is hope. And when there is hope, there is waiting. That's the hard part among people, even Christians. It's hard for them to wait. But those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They climb up with wings as eagle. They will run and not weary. And they will walk and not faint. That is the promise that those people who trust in God... You will never get weary. You will never, you will never fail. And, and somehow we fail in this world. But in our service, in our service to God and service to others, we will never fail. Because God is with us. He is our Emmanuel. And we are, you know, when you said that, in, many people, they think, who are the most influential people in the world? Do you think the President of United States of America? Do you think that U.S., the Hollywood? Yeah, that is common. Everybody tried to imitate Hollywood. Everybody tried to imitate United States of America. Everybody wants to come to America even to risk their life to cross the border. How many today, right now? Thousands and thousands that crossing the border of United States of America. Because they are, they think the hope is in America. The truth is not in America that you're hoping for. The truth is what you need to hope for is God. What, what, Paul, what Paul is saying in 1 Corinthians 15, 19, especially for this Christian, for you Christian, listen to this. If your hope in Christ is just for this life, then you are the most pitied people in the world. It's just like saying this. You Christian, if your hope in Christ is in America, then you are the most pitied person in the world. That's what it's just meant, like something. If your hope is only in the money, if your hope is only in your job, if your hope is only in the things that you see like this house, then you are the most pitied person in the world. Not me that's saying that is the word of God. I think the, the essential for hope is eternal, is trust, obedience, humility, and endurance. Now, speaking of influential, you must be the one to influence this world. Not President Trump, not president of anyone. No one in this world, famous or whoever, 
that have this ability or capability like doctors, attorney, or whoever. They're not, I mean, they can influence if they really trust God. But you, as a Christian, don't look at yourself. I'm just an ordinary person. No, you're not. You're special. You are meant to, to influence the world. It doesn't matter if you're not a doctor, a lawyer, or president. What matters is who you are in Jesus. You hear me? Who you are in Jesus is what is matter. And, and then you can make influence. You can change the world. You can be a history maker. So much for that for my reviews, but I know you heard all of this. But this is the thing. What would be our response to what God has given us? Because of Jesus, the light shine in the darkness. Because of Jesus, now you can be influenced. You will shine because of Jesus. Because of his birth, there is hope. And it happened on perfect day and perfect evening. And then you will be his son and children, I called, daughter, that enable to empower other people. That is influence. Many people don't have that boldness and courageousness. So to introduce to you how we respond to all of these things. First of all, God chose to dwell on us. God chose to dwell in us to show his deepest love for us, to give us peace because he knows we are in trouble. He, gave us, he wants to give us peace because he knows that we, we are in trouble. And to bring that joy that we need because we live in the influence of an unsatisfactory world. What does that mean? People are not satisfied. Anything in this world, nobody's in this world are satisfied. Men looking for something that they don't see. Men looking for something that, that not there. Like, I'm just giving you an example. When we have lots of food last Sunday, we have plenty of food. Did you see the food that we have? It's overwhelming, right? It's a, it's a lot on our Christmas celebration. But somebody told me this. There is no lichon. <laughs> see, people never satisfied. They're still looking for something that is not there. And that is what the instinct. That is what peoples are. And this is our world today. We are, it is unsatisfactory world. No satisfaction. And that's why God gave us that, God came to us to give us joy. Because we, we are not satisfied of anything. We are not, it, this is not enough. Well, to tell you the truth, the grace of God is enough. And I believe God will not come down on this if we can just rely on man or anything that he created. Do you, do you think so? You know, if, if we can just rely on this world, if, he, if God knows that we can rely on this world and we can rely on other people, I think he will not come. You, you can do it. You can deal with it. No, we can't deal with it. That's why Jesus came. Right? <laughs> this word is hard to tell you the truth. And now, for our response, the like to influence. Isaiah 9, 1, verse 7, as we keep going on to those things. The people who walk in the darkness have seen a great light. That's what he said in verse 2 of Isaiah 9. Those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. You have multiplied the nation and increased its joy. They rejoice before you according to the joy of harvest as man Rejoice when they divide the spoil. Jesus said this. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in the darkness, but will be the light of life. See, that is your influence, folks. You know, you are called to be the light. You are called to be like Jesus. To shine. In the darkness. It is given to you. Now, the moment that Jesus said that, what do you feel like? How do you perceive? Or how do you, what is your perception? Or what is your uh, instinct on how you, 
you perceive that thought of knowing I am the light and those who follow me. Are you the follower? Are you a follower of Jesus? If you are a follower of Jesus, then you can shine. You will be the light of life. Wow, what a purpose. Do you, did you see that? This is your purpose, to be the light of life. All right, not to be the darkness of this life. You're not called to be dark of life. You are called to be light. You are called to shine. Amen? So let's see our response. Let's see first, number one, the background of our response. Uh, the background of our response, of course, for unto us a child is born on perfect evening. And if you look at Jesus was born in a manger, right? Let's find out more about that. And here it was in the animal cage, you know. A, a, a king was born in an animal cage. Now let's find out the background. First, the fall of man in Genesis chapter 3. And then the rise of man in Luke chapter 2, verse 1 to 20, and Mark 2, 1 and 20. That's the story of Jesus Christ right there when he was born. Now, the fall of man, emphasize this word. Uh, in Genesis chapter 3, when men fall, uh, why did men fall? You know, of course, Satan came. The enemy came to the man. The enemy came to people, and he said this to them. You know what? If you will eat this fruit of knowledge, you will be like God. You will know what is good, and you know what is evil. What is, and then, and the man has somewhat like thinking, wow, is it so? Yes, it will happen. And then man bite it. You know what they did? What they did? What the man did is actually bite the pride. They want, they have that pride. Now, the enemy brought pride to man that's why they fell into sin that is the man fall because of pride we have they have that motivation i wanted to be like god i mean of course to be like him as holy and righteous yes but knowing all these things good and evil god doesn't want you to be that that way god wants you to be innocent that's why Paul emphasized that in Romans 16, 19 says, Be excellent of what is good and be innocent of evil. That is the echo of Genesis chapter 3, that God doesn't want you to be good looking uh, on evil things, but rather be innocent of all these evil things and be doing what is righteous. Right? And, and here, here's, that's why men fall. He brought, say, enemy, the enemy brought a pride, and man bite it, and then, become, and then they fall. And now, this is the redemption. The, ra, the, ra, the rise of man is that when Jesus was born. Jesus was born to bring that pride. Uh, the opposite spirit of pride is what? Humility. If you look at why he was born in a manger, of all places, why there is no room that night, why there is no hotel or, la or, or somewhat like a place, a good place at least, a comfortable place to, lead, to, to, to give birth to Jesus, why there is no place like that, even just a small house, why in the cage of animals and in a manger? You know why? Because God wants, God brings humility. God wants to see, for us to see that humility is what we need. Because 
That's what the enemy brought to you in the very beginning. Why you fail. Why men fall into sin. Why men fell into sin. Because the enemy brought pride to man. And the men take it, took it. And that's why they fall. And now God is bringing that humility. And that humility, it's it shown to when he was born. Imagine a king of kings and a lord of lords on the universe, born in a manger. How could that be? By just simply showing to all of us, man, you need to humble yourself. You hear me? Now, this, this is just an introduction to you guys. It's just the base. Number one is the background of what we're our response should be. And, and here, number two, our response should be based on attitude, on the attitude of our Lord Jesus. And it's in Philippians 2, verse 5. Of course, you will see it all, all throughout. And here, Paul emphasizes the attitude of Jesus Christ. What he says, humility and obedience should be our attitude in our response to that born in a manger. A child was born for all of us in a manger. And this is, should be our response, to be humble and to be obedient. To be what? Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. What are those? Hum humility and obedience. What is in the mind of Jesus? Hum humility, humbleness, and obedience. Who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Look at that. But made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bond servant and coming in the likeness of man and being found in appearance as man. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. That that is something, isn't it? That is something for us to look at. How many people are willing to humble themselves? As again, you know, um, again, the enemy came to the world and brought pride to people and human became disobedient. Jesus Christ, our Lord, came to the world and countered the opposite spirit, he humbled himself and became obedient. How many Christians today wanted to counter that spirit of pride, the spirit of disobedience? Hey, listen, it's about time to respond to that born in a manger, response in humility and response in obedience to God. Even on death on the cross, yes, even on death. While you still have this breath of life that comes, from, that comes from God, while you're still alive, then do what is righteous. Take that opposite spirit. You know, we're not fighting against flesh and blood. Remember that. We're fighting against that spirit. What is that spirit that we don't like? Pride. Maybe that pride is in you. You, want that, you don't like that spirit of disobedience? Maybe that spirit of disobedience is in you. So take that out. You know how you take that out? Just simply respond to what Jesus gave it to you and show it to you. To be humble and to be obedient to the Lord. Amen. And then that opposite spirit will be gone to tell you the truth. I experienced this myself and that is the true miracle many people expecting miracle that people will live the red the dead will rise the man will will see the blind man will see the lame man walk that's what we know the miracle is the god will provide for all my needs that's the miracle that we wanted to see no the first miracle that one wanted to see is deep inside that change that transformation that's what we need to see. 
That's what we wanted that miracle to happen in our life. The true miracle is the true transformation. You know why? Because the word is not, the, there no one and not of this word can change a human being. No one can change you. Not even money can change you. Not even people can change you. The only can change you is God. And that is the miracle. Because no one and nobody, they have no ability or capability or power. They might have the ability to, hey, I'll give you money and you change. No. Yes, for the meantime, you'll change. But there's, if there's no money supply, you'll go back. Right? I, you know, how many of you uh, used to drink alcohol like me? I used to. I, I, I used to drink alcohol and I get drunk, you know. And people encourage me, hey, don't drink, don't do that, don't do that. You know. <laughs> but no one changed me. I, I give you money, don't, don't drink. No. I still want it, right? Only God can change me. There's a lot of things that uh, some peop- God make a way, you know, in somewhat how you be changed. And that's the thing that we are in, not in control of. Only God. Only God can change. And, and I think through that, through that response that we have based on the attitude of our Lord Jesus Christ and how we change, we will shine. We will shine. And when we said that these things, when we have that humility, when we have that obedience, you know, you will be a light bearer. And to be a light bearer, that is our response, to be a light bearer, right? In Philippians 2, same chapter, verse 12 20 to 18. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, this is what Paul is saying, but now much more in my absence, work out of your salvation your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Do all things without complaining and disputing that you may become blameless and harmless. Children of God without fault in the midst of crook and perverse generation among whom you shine as light in the words holding fast the word of life so that may so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. I like, I like what Paul is saying here for all of us to, to think about. This is what, what trying, that's what we wanted to implement in, in this church into the body of Christ. To put this together, it's hard. But if we are willing and to determine, you know, it will happen. Determine to humble ourselves and to surrender and obey God, no matter what, it will happen. Many of you, somebody came up to me at the airport when I dropped off Tate Rick to Italy. And he said, and he asked me this, How Snuma Church is revival going on? I said, Yes. And then he was thinking revival is a lot of people. So how many of you now? Are you thousands, hundreds? I said, no, we're the same. Where there's people coming in and go. How do you mean revival? You said it's a revival. Yes, there's happening revival. Because I said the true, tran- the true revival is transformation. When people grow in the Lord, that is the true mm-hmm. revival. Revival is not about something that a lot of people you see. Revival is something when a person changed, transformed, that is revival for me. No matter how many people there, 16,000 in your church, but all of them are not changed. All of them are not transformed. They always rely on this word. They always rely on this prosperity thing. And the gospel is not about prosperity. It's about repentance. It's about turning from Romy to Jesus. You hear me? That is transformation. That is the true revival. 
A light bearer is something that we can look upon ourselves today. What should be like to be a light bearer? A light bearer is you must shine. Just like what, what, the Bible, what Jesus said. Jesus said this, I am the light. And you are the light. Right? Jesus first, he said in John chapter 8, I am the light. And Jesus said to people as well, to his disciples and to all of us today, that you are the light. And you must shine. Just like, just like a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. What does that mean? To be bold and to be courageous. To bring the gospel to people. How to shine? By simply humbling yourself and obey God. That's how you shine. Because not in this word is, it, it, is something that you can look at. Oh, yeah, they're Christians. They're humble? No. Are they obedient to God? No. They're Christians. Yeah. They're doing good. Yes, they're doing good. But the question is not what they're doing good. Are they doing righteously? And my conclusion is this. We can't, just, we can't just be good. We must be righteous. Because not every good is righteous. You hear me? Or maybe you're against with these things. Really, Pastor? Not every good is righteous. I thought all good things is good. All good things is righteous. No. Tell you the truth. Uh, there, there's something deeper than what we're thinking about. In 1 Samuel 15, 22, look at this. What is more pleasing to the Lord? You burnt offering and sacrifices. Burnt offering and sacrifices is good. Right? Nothing wrong about that. Or your obedience to his voice. Listen, obedience is better than sacrifice. And submission is better than offering fat of rams. Do you see that? Submission is humility. Obedience is better than sacrifices. Humility and obedience comes first. This is how we should respond in order for us to shine. We can't just shine by just simply serving the Lord, by just putting sacrifices in, in, in your time with God. I love you all. Thank you for being, and I'm so glad you're my partner in serving Jesus Christ. But my point here is not about serving. It's not about giving sacrificial things. Well, I, I appreciate that. And God will appreciate those things that you make an effort to, to, to give time to the Lord. But what a shame for more people that who don't give time to the Lord. <laughs> right? But you, you're there already. But this is another for us to, to, to look at in our lives. And how many of you are willing to be corrected? It's hard to be corrected by someone else. Right? So nobody wants to be corrected because we have all these things little called ego. And that is pride. And we want to remove that for us to be corrected. Because you cannot be corrected by someone else. You cannot be corrected even God because you still have that ego and pride. I know all of this. Really? A friend of mine, a, 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 a one, thing, one disciple that I have in, in the Philippines asked me this question. You know, and when is the time that we can, when we can uh, say that we are matured Christian? I'm going to ask you today, are you matured Christian? Sometimes you see, you think, yeah, right? Yeah. I myself, and I, this is what I answered. Pastor, I think you, should, you are a matured Christian. That's what he said. And I wanted to be a matured Christian too. When is the time that I can be matured? You know, I told him, yeah, you might see me. I'm a matured Christian because I've been in the Christian for a while. I've been having relationship with the Lord for a while. But I said, I still, I'm still a baby. 
I still wanted to know the mystery of God more and more in my life. I still haven't discovered more. I mean, of course, I know God. I have relationship with him, but I want more of him. And I think maturity, it, it comes to the point that knowing that you wanted to be transformed to be like Jesus. I said, when you realize that you wanted to be more like him, then you are matured. But when you stop knowing him and you don't want to be like him, you know, don't have the desire to be like Jesus, then you're not matured yet. You hear me, folks? Yeah. How many of you to be like Jesus? Yeah. Then you are a matured Christian. But if you stop knowing him and you don't want to be like him, then you're not a matured Christian. That's why I said, until the last breath that I have, I want, I want that desire in my life to be like him so that I will be called a matured Christian. Willing to eat, willing to be corrected, willing to be discipled by God. You hear me, folks? Now, again, coming back, even Esther did righteously so the enemy fell into their own trap. You know the story of Esther, right? Esther is, is, is the queen of, of, I don't know what is that kingdom, Assyria, uh, Babylon, I don't know. But anyway, I forgot. Persia, Persia there you go, the, king, the queen of Persia, right? If you know, you know, Haman is the, Haman is the enemy, actually. And Esther finally makes her request in Esther chapter 7, it said, Spare my life, O king. And Haman went to dine in with Queen Esther. And on the second day at the banquet of wine, the king again said to Esther, What is your petition? Queen Esther said, It shall be granted to you. That's what the king said. And what is your request? Up to the half of kingdom, it shall be done. Then Queen Esther answered and said, look at what Queen Esther is full of wisdom and righteous. He said, if I have found favor in your sight, O king, and if it pleases the king, let my life given me at my petition. And my people at my request, for we have been slave, I would have held my tongue, although the enemy could never compensate for the king's loss. So here, the statement of of Esther is so powerful. It's so humble. It, it's so uh, uh, it's so genuine, and it's true to his king. You know, in, in in his petition that let my life be given me at my petition. Esther also showed wisdom in how she framed her request. She appealed on a personal basis, knowing that she had never done anything but to please the king. Now, when you ask for forgiveness, someone, make sure it's genuine. Make sure you please that person. Whether he, forgive, whether he forgives you or he won't forgive you. It's humility. It's obedience. Because look at what Haman found his end. On the same instrument he had intended for the death of Mordecai, he was caught in his own trap. Right? Because he is trying to hang, that is his plan, to hang Mordecai. But it happened to him. See, we don't want to be that way. We don't want to be trapped on our own agenda, on our own plan. But be wise. Like the wisdom that Esther has to trap the enemy. How can you trap the enemy in, all, you know, in his own plan and his own thing? Then take that opposite spirit that I'm talking about. If your enemy, if the spirit that you see is hatred, then love. If the enemy that you see uh, is full of anger, what you should do? Love. If the enemy is trying to be prideful or to be somewhat like doesn't want you to be, st to be in you know, corrected, then be humble. Take an opposite spirit, right? If enemy is, is something that, uh, something that 
trying to uh, push you to, 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 to something that you don't like. What you should do, simple. It's not allowing him, but rather show mercy to him. Because Jesus said is this, in Matthew 9.13 and Matthew 12.7, twice that Jesus said this to the Pharisees that trying to tempt him, that trying to seduce him or to trying to make him angry. You know what he says? Jesus said, I desire mercy than sacrifice. I don't care what he does. I don't care what you did. But I desire mercy for you. I forgive them. You know, the situation, you, you will read Matthew chapter 9, and you will read Matthew 12. You know, those are two different situations, two different scenarios. But Jesus chose to desire mercy for these people rather than sacrifice. You hear me? It's not about, what, oh, you know, uh, you know, because sometimes little things that we sacrifice, we complain. We think we did a good job, right? But not every good is righteous. You know what the best example? A fairy tale. A fairy tale of Robin Hood. You know Robin Hood? Robin Hood is still money from the enemy, right? From, from the rich people. And then he gave to people that he needs. He gave to people that he needs. Wow, that's good. But what he did not, what is not righteous, because what he stole is from what? From the other people. That is not righteous. That is the, did, did you see the difference between good and righteousness? Right? You can do good. Many people out there, well, Jesus loves you. I'm okay. I'm good. I don't harm people. I love Jesus. Something like that. Right? How many people that you are trying to reach them out and say, Jesus loves you or, or pray for you or things like that? No, I'm okay. You don't have to pray for me. I'm good. Wow, yeah, you're good, but you're not righteous, to tell you the truth. Well, too, we're not trying to judge because we desire mercy than sacrifice, like what Jesus said. We, we, we owe to them. We sympathize these people. Yeah, that's true. Okay, don't get me wrong. Like Jesus did, right? Matthew is a tax collector and he's a sinner. It's in Matthew chapter 9. And, he, and, and this tax collector, they do sin. But why Jesus mingled with them? Why Jesus was with them? And that's what the Pharisees and Sadducees asked that question. Why Jesus, your teacher, is with this People that are full of sin. Right? And, and Jesus responds, simple. I desire mercy, not, not sacrifice. Now, who we are to judge, right? Yes, that's true. We cannot judge or we cannot... Uh, give me the word. <laughs> we cannot judge or we cannot even uh, condemn. Thank you. We cannot condemn the people, others, but we can reject their sin. So Jesus did not condemn them, did not judge them, but he rejected their sins. That's what we are to be humble and how to be obedient. Love these people, but reject their sin. Homosexual, lesbian, what else? Criminals, murderer. Thief, love these people, but reject their sins. Did you hear me, folks? That is humility and that is obedience. Now, how we apply these things together? One, two, three. <laughs> you see that today is 12-31-23. Can you see something? You know what? I see that. Is this one, two, three? Let's go. Ready? Get set. Go. Ready? Get set. Go. This is how we should apply this. No more waiting. 
Come on. One, two, three. Let's go. Are you ready? Are you ready to respond in humility and obedience to God? Let's go. It's about transformation begins towards you. Let that light shine in the darkness. Isaiah 9, 2, John 8, 12. That light from Jesus, that light is in you. And that light must shine now. One, two, three. Let's go. You hear me? <laughs> Matthew 5, 14, verse 16. You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one likes a lamb and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is a place on a stand where it gives light into everyone in the house. In the same way, let your God did shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. Now you want to see the glory of God. Then you must shine. Don't hide that light. Amen. This world needs light. It's full of darkness. We need to shine. Come on, church. It's about time. If you want to shine? Be humble and be obedient. Make a difference. These people are full of pride. Let come to that opposite spirit. Be humble and you will shine. Amen. These people are full of disobedience to God. Then be obedient and you will shine. These people full of hatred, then be loving. These people are full of sorrow and, 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 and no calmness in their life, full of troubles, then be peaceful and you will shine. These people are full of sadness and long faces, then be joyful and smile. You will shine. These people are hopeless. I'm a homeless. Then give that hope in them. The hope is not about the hope of money, the hope of material things, the hope of this world, but the hope in Jesus. That's what people need. And then you will shine. Transformation begins, as I said. And in here is my prayer for all of us today. Now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do His will, every righteousness, that's why I said, to do His will, working in you what is well, pleasing in His sight. Everything that needs to be pleasing in His sight. Through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I'm not just going to say Happy New Year to you. I'm going to say a blessed 2024, not Happy New Year. Why is that, Pastor? Because January 1 is one day. That is a new year. But we have 360 days that we need to be blessed and need to be prospered. Not, I mean, prosper in all aspects of our lives. Do you hear me? So I'm greeting you a blessed 2024 for all of you and a happy new year. Amen. May, may we stand. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. And now we respond in humility and in obedience to be a light bearers of this word, to shine in the darkness. Let it be and fall upon us all today, Lord Jesus. Even those people are watching on Facebook and via Zoom, let that light shine. Let that Jesus shine through humility, through obedience, uh, to our response to you, Lord, just like what you did. Even death on the cross, you humble yourself and be obedient. So, Lord, pour this out right now. And today we will say, one, two, three. We will go. We will go. Can we say, we will go? Ready? Get set? Go! Amen. Thank you, Lord. In hands and give us pure hearts and let
Let us not lift our souls to another and give us clean hands, we pray. Give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our soul to another. And oh God, let us be a gentleman. Two, three, let's go home.